So if there had been a pop quiz today, it would have been, you know, state Stirling's formula. Okay, so you should be able to say Stirling's formula. So n factorial is approximately n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n. You can do a little bit better. You can actually create a series expansion. 1 plus 1 over 12 n plus dot dot dot. And when you have an expansion like this, the more terms you have, the more accurate the approximation could be. Now if you want to think about this as to how accurate is this, the expansion here, we have a 1 over 12 n. So if n is about 100, which is already enough to overflow most of your calculators, and you're asking for 100 factorial, I'm off by about 1 over 1,000. So in terms of how many digits accuracy I have, this is not great. But you have to remember the astronomical size of these numbers. You know, 100 factorial is enormous. If you want to get a sense of sizes, there are about 10 to the 80, 10 to the 90 doohickey theorem of all modicumic orbs in the universe, roughly. Okay? Try to see how big 10, I'm sorry, how big 100 factorial is. Okay? It's going to be much larger than that. So in terms of the actual size of the number, while we may only have about three or four digits accuracy, we have the correct main order of magnitude. And as n gets larger and larger and larger, this gets better and better and better. Okay? There are a lot of different ways to prove Stirling's formula. I'm not going to go through a full rigorous proof. There's a pretty close approximation using the method of stationary phase. Later today, I will talk about a pretty close proof using uh, the central limit theorem, which we haven't proved yet. We will mostly prove the central limit theorem later in the semester, which would then give us a proof of uh, Stirling's formula. Now, whenever you see a formula, you always want to ask, is this reasonable? Something should look a little bit strange as soon as you see this formula. Which part of this expression looks strange? Any part looks strange to you? Yes? E to the negative n. Okay, why e to the negative n looking strange? Because it decreases as n gets bigger. So one thing is it is decreasing as n gets bigger. I can try to relate, though. I can write it as maybe n over e to the n. And so if I write like that, maybe it's not so bad now. But we still have, of course, the presence of e. Why do we have an e here? To me, there's something else that looks a little strange in this formula. Yeah. So this is one of the few formulas that has both e and pi in it. Notice pi is not alone. Not only is pi with a 2, because again, there's a huge debate as to which is the fundamental number, pi or 2 pi. And there are a couple of people who celebrate Tau Day. It's a square root of 2 pi. Have we seen square root of 2 pi anywhere? Where have we seen square root of 2 pi? Standard normal. The normalization constant. This is telling us there may actually be a connection between the gamma, between the factorial and the normal, and the central limit theorem. If you recall the gamma function, gamma of s is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x, x to the s minus 1 dx, you know, real part of s greater than 0. What's nice here is now we've got an e coming in. OK, that could be good maybe for over here. This is the equal to, you know, we get gamma of n plus 1 is n factorial, n greater than or equal to 0 is an integer. Gamma of 1 half was the square root of pi. And this was the normalization constant. And we saw during the change of variables that the moments of the standard normal actually can be interpreted as values of the gamma function. So there's a lot of connections between all these different things. And I'll try to show later today where this square root of 2 pi is coming from. But again, rather than going through lots of algebra, which trust me we will do, I want to start by doing just a little bit of basic algebra as to is this reasonable? Well. I have an approximation for n factorial. So let's do a, a sanity check. So uh, the people who are watching this on video, you did not hear the stupidest question I was ever you know, heard a reporter ask. But this 
is probably close to the easiest question I can ask you mathematically. What is n plus 1 factorial divided by n factorial? n plus 1, n plus one OK? Not quite as bad as the question you know, the reporter asked, but this is not a bad question. If we believe that this is a good approximation for n factorial, well, let's check. n plus 1 factorial divided by n factorial should be approximately n plus 1 to the n plus 1 e to the negative n plus 1 square root of 2 pi n plus 1 divided by n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n. Well, square root of 2 pi n plus 1 over square root of 2 pi n, as n gets very, very large, this is approximately 1. If you wanted to keep things a little bit more accurate, we could keep it as a 1 plus 1 over n. We have an e to the negative n plus 1. We have an e to e to the negative n. We're left with an e to the minus 1. Over here, we have a n plus 1 to the n plus 1 over n to the n. So this is going to give us, um, we have an extra n plus 1. And now we have n plus 1 over n to the n, 1 plus 1 over n to the n. As n goes to infinity, what does 1 plus 1 over n to the n go to? e. This goes to e. So this whole expression is basically looking a lot like n plus 1, because this will go to 1. Probably to 1. OK? So this is not a proof that Stirling's formula is correct. But this is a really easy calculation we can do, a quick sanity check to see is this reasonable? OK? Uh, mixing up applications and checks. Uh, one of the applications, so estimating binomial coefficients. So I think earlier in the semester, I said that the first time I was teaching this class at Brown, I was preparing at Ohio State. I was looking at the book that I was told we were going to use. I was able to get an older version of it in the library. And the solution to one of the problems was a binomial coefficient. And the book said, you may think you're done, you're not. And I was like, no, I'm done. I... And then the book went on to say, we have to find a way to evaluate the binomial coefficient. With computers now, evaluating binomial coefficients is not that bad. But you know, if you have very large numbers, this could be a real challenge. And I actually got asked something like this at dinner years ago when I was interviewing for a job. It was actually the same year I was interviewing for the job at Williams. Uh, in the news was the result that, this was 2008, that Clinton and Obama exactly tied in Syracuse, New York. They both received 6,001 votes. And people were talking about how unlikely this was. And some of the estimates in the newspapers were that the probability of this happening was one in a million. And somebody remarked that over dinner, and I said, no, it's not one in a million. It's much, much less. I'm sorry, it's, uh, sorry, it's much, much higher probability than that. You know, give me a napkin, because that's how we do mathematics. And so as a really quick calculation, you know, the probability is much higher than one over a million, depending on how you model things. So back then, Clinton was secretary, I'm sorry, not secretary, uh, this was before she was secretary. She was senator from the state of New York. So you might assume that she is more likely to get votes in New York than Obama. So are you trying to model each person as having a 50-50 chance of getting each voter? Or do you assume Clinton has a higher percent chance of getting the vote? The other thing is maybe people have different probabilities in different parts of the state. Maybe Clinton does better in uh, New York City and not as well in upstate New York. So depending on what model you use for the probability people get a vote in Syracuse, New York, you will get a very different answer. Let's take the simplest model. What should be the probability of getting a vote? One half. And let's take n to be 12,002. So the probability of a tie, well, we have 12,002. We need 6,000 to vote a certain way. We get one half to the 6,001. And just writing things in terrible overkill, 12,002 minus 6,001. So really what we have here is we have 2n choose n times 1 over 2 to the 2n. 
And this is approximately, you know, I did the calculation, square root of pi n. So the exact answer was 0 0.007, I think, 728. Using Sterling, we get 0 0.005 something, I think, 00514. So here's a nice application of Sterling. You know, to quickly estimate how big do you think 2n choose n is going to be. I am not going to calculate uh, 12,002 factorial over 6,001 factorial, 6,001 factorial on a napkin at dinner. But I can do the Sterling approximation very easily and you'll get a probability of roughly, you know, 5 in 1,000. And you'll ballpark, I'm within a factor of 2. That's not a bad calculation very easily. Now, as you change the probability from a half, and I guess if I'm you know, really being pedantic, I should really write this as 1 minus a half. Uh, as you change the probability away from a half, this probability is going to get much, much smaller. And you'll get much closer to the 1 in a million that was being quoted in a lot of newspapers. All right, so this is you know, one of the nice applications of Sterling's formulas, getting some estimate for something like this. If you want to do anything theoretical, you want to have exact closed form expressions, you want to see how things depend with n. This allows you to get some n dependence in a very nice, accessible way. All right, any questions on what we've done so far? What yes? Said, you said you changed the, the Oh, so the, the probability being one half. So Hillary Clinton won New York with, I think, 57% of the vote. So if we change from 0.5 to 0.57, then the probability is going to become significantly smaller of a tie. If, if you still operate under the assumption that like every final possibility is equally... Well, no, but see, as soon as you now say Hillary Clinton has a 57% chance of getting each vote, it's no it's longer going to have... The tie becomes much less likely. Things are going to be clustered with her getting around 57% of the 12,000 votes. Again, this is one of the dangers of when you apply mathematics, are you applying it in the correct place? What is the correct estimate for the probability that Clinton and Obama get votes in Syracuse, New York? Do you look at statewide results and say, well, Syracuse behaves the same way as the rest of the state? You know, the city of New York has a huge population and has a very different feel than other parts. So is it valid to be using that? Uh, if you go back to calculus, um, they often give you examples of a car driving on a highway to illustrate the derivative and you can talk about the average speed on a trip and the instantaneous speed. If I want to calculate my, uh, my instantaneous speed, how do you calculate the instantaneous speed on a car trip? So how does the speedometer work? So it looks at revolutions per second. So it looks at a small amount of time and it sees how far have you gone in a small amount of time. The smaller window you use, the more accurate that's going to be for instantaneous speed. You don't want to have a window of you know, five hours you know, on a long trip to get your instantaneous speed. You might have traffic, you might have construction. All right, so we'll keep Sterling's formula here. The goal now is to try to approximate Sterling's formula elementarily. So the goal is approximate the above elementarily. So different people have different definitions of what is an elementary argument. For the most part, no calculus. Right. Something you can do with a high school student who hasn't seen calculus, that's considered elementary. So I want bounds for n factorial. I want upper bounds and lower bounds. As long as they're correct, they can be stupid. I would prefer you not to give me negative numbers for lower bounds. So. And I'd prefer you not to give me positive infinity as an upper bound. OK? I have to say this after last year. Can anybody give me a lower bound for n factorial? It can be really bad. 1. 1 less than equal to n factorial. Can anybody give me an upper bound? n to the n. n, to the n. All right? There's our bounds. They suck. OK? Can we do better? Good. Huge improvement. 
Unfortunately, this is nowhere near the truth. There is a huge spread between the low and the upper bound. Our goal is to try to get the low and the upper bounds close to each other. If we can get them close to each other, we've seen the truth. Right now, we have no idea what the truth is. Which is actually closer to the truth, the lower or the upper? Which do you think? Upper. Upper. Now, the difficulty is we have the n divided by e. So the n to the n looks good, but we're missing that e to the minus n. e to the minus n is pretty big. So the, the question is, how can we do better? So one of my favorite techniques is called dyadic decomposition. And the idea is you want to break your problem up into subproblems, solve the subproblems, and then piece them together. Do a lot of small, easy tasks rather than one hard task. The other thing is, if you specialize, things don't vary that much. So right now, we're going, you know, n factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 all the way up to n. Our numbers vary enormously. What I want to do is I want to work on a smaller scale. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to worry about doing things exactly correct on the board. So for me, if I have n over 2, I will implicitly assume that n is even. If I have n over 4, I will assume n is a multiple of 4. I'm not going to worry about tweaking things and using the floor function and the ceiling function. The idea is to give you a sense of how these arguments work. You can either ignore all of these issues by dealing with n as a perfect power of 2, or you can do the bookkeeping. All right? Let's split it in half. In this interval, all of my numbers are at most n, and they're all at least n halves. On this interval, all of my numbers are at most n halves, and at least 1. So I get 1 to the n halves, n halves to the n halves, less than equal to n factorial, is less than equal to n halves to the n halves, n to the n halves. OK? And again, I'm not going to worry about, I should maybe write this as n halves minus 1 or something like that. I'm not worrying about any of that stuff right now. It does not matter. The lecture is going to be involved enough as is. You don't want to see that. All right? So let's see what we have. We get n halves to the n halves as the lower bound, less than or equal to n factorial, less than or equal to, uh, this is actually looking pretty good. We have n to the n, and then we have 2 to the negative n halves. Or, a better way of writing this is n factorial less than or equal to n to the n square root of 2 to the negative n. I'm not going to worry about the lower bound. We'll just concentrate on the upper bound from now on. How does this compare to Sterling? What do you think? Good, bad, horrible? So it's getting closer to Stirling's bound. I'm overestimating by a lot, because rather than having e to the minus n, I have square root of 2 to the minus n. But notice how much better this is than just the n to the n. I've now got a square root of 2 to the minus n. I've got some number. Well, I can do the dyadic again. And again, I'm only going to concentrate on the upper bounds now. n halves, uh, n fourths, 3n over 4, and n. And so we get n factorial is less than or equal to, in this interval, I have n fourths to the n fourths, n halves to the n fourths, 3n over 4 to the n fourths, and then n to the n fourths. And so we get n factorial is less than or equal to n to the n, and now, um, I'll write this as 2 fourths. So 1 fourth times 2 fourths times 3 fourths. Uh, 2 cancels with that. That becomes a 2, 16, 32, 3 30 seconds. So I'll write it as 32 thirds. 
negative n over 4. All right, who's got a calculator? I need the fourth root of 32 thirds, the square root of the square root. So we get n factorial is approximately less than n to the n, approximately the fourth root of 32 over 3. I know 32 is, three to, is 2 to the fifth, so I've got a 2, and then I've got the fourth root of 2 thirds. So it's going to be around 2. What do you get? One point eight. One point eight zero seven. All right, so a little bit less than two, as we would expect, because we have two thirds, uh, fourth root of that. That's going to be less than one. We're supposed to get e, which is two point seven one eight. We're already at one point eight zero seven. Square root of two is one point four one four. That's not bad improvement with just doing one more iteration. The question becomes: If you keep going along these lines, how much further can you push it? I'll do one more comment about how you can try to make these arguments even better. What are we doing? We're doing this dyadic decomposition. We're breaking the interval up into subintervals. And the idea is, if we break things up into subintervals, on those subintervals, there's not that much change in what's going on. And so we can approximate things with one value and be OK. It's not going to be perfect, and that's why we're not getting E here. But it's going to be ballpark. If we're willing to do a little bit more work, we can actually get a better result faster. So we have to go back to calculus now. But you can actually do this without calculus, so I'll put it in parentheses. So I know a lot of you have had me for Calc 3, and we did the Farmer-Brown problem. Uh, hopefully you've all seen this in a calculus class. Farmer-Brown loves rectangles and will not consider any other shape for the pen for his cows. Okay, and as we're at Williams, how cows, how cows are fenced in is of prime importance. Okay? So if Farmer Brown has a certain amount of fence and he has to have a rectangular pen, what kind of rectangle has the maximum area for a given perimeter? Square. square. So what you can do is you can say, I have x, I have y, I have x plus y, the semi-perimeter is fixed, and I want to maximize x times y subject to x plus y equals p. Well, since x plus y equals p, I can write y as uh, p minus x. And if you look at what goes on, it's a parabola. It's 0 when x equals 0. It's 0 when x equals p. The maximum is going to be when the each p halves, and it's a square. You can, of course, also use calculus to prove this. But there's no need to use calculus. You can do it entirely elementarily with a parabola. Why is this useful? Well, let's think about what's going on. Let's go back to, hell, let's not even do our first one. Um, let's not even do a dyadic decomposition. We're multiplying all the numbers 1 through n. Let's match them in pairs. 1 times n, 2 times n minus 1, 3 times n minus 2. What can you say about each of those products? What can you say about each of those products? Why n squared? Not n squared. Right. It's technically n, technically I'm supposed to do n plus 1 over 2 squared because they're summing up to, I'm not going to worry about that, this is the rough test. It's roughly n over 2 times n over 2. Think of each one of these as a rectangle where the semi-perimeter is n plus 1. The maximum the area can be, the maximum the product can be is when you have a square. So each of these products is going to be bounded by n half squared. So you get n factorial is less than or equal to n halves squared. And then how many pairs do we have? n over 2. All right, the 2's cancel, and we get n to the n, 2 to the minus n. So without even doing any dyadic decomposition, we actually get 
as well as we did with the first dyadic decomposition. This essentially saves us one dyadic decomposition and speeds up the process a little bit. Okay? I'm not going to go through doing the rest of the argument. It's in the book. It's very similar to this. But the idea is we can refine these guesses. And if anybody's interested, this would make a great project to see, can you actually push this all the way and make a proof? Can you actually get to Sterling by you know, continuing to push it along these lines? But you know, again, what I like about this is this illustrates an extremely powerful technique. OK. So the goal is no longer to approximate, is to now evaluate exactly or damn close. OK. So the next thing is we're going to use calculus. This is very similar to what we were talking about in the last class, where we were comparing divide and conquer versus Newton's method. Why is Newton's method so much better than divide and conquer? It knows calculus. Why do you think we have you guys spend all this time taking calculus classes in high school? It's not because we're, we've run out of math to teach you. you know, there's a reason why so much of mathematics is building up to calculus. You can use calculus to approximate difficult functions well. It is an extremely useful method. And so it's time to start using it. Let's get some dividends. So the first thing is we, we have n factorial. It's n, n minus 1, n minus 2, dot, 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 3 times 2 times 1. So Pavlovian response. So it's late enough in the semester, and for some of you, this is not your first semester with me, that you should have a Pavlovian response right now. What should you be doing? Log. Logs. Take log. Whenever you have a product, your first response should be take a logarithm. If you then realize you are in an elementary school and talking to kids who are just learning how to multiply, okay, then go back. But except for situations like that, when you see products, you should be thinking logarithms. We do not have advanced classes in product theory. We do not talk about Riemann products. We talk about Riemann sums. We know how to handle sums. Is there any real difference between understanding sums and understanding products? No. If you understand a sum, you can exponentiate it and get a product. You can pass back and forth between the two. That said, we have experience with sums. We are used to working with sums. If you are used to working with something, cast it in that light. It is amazing how much of a difference this makes. Anybody play bridge here? Right. The first time I ever swore at a student was um, two years ago when I was teaching some students in probability how to play bridge. And it's a long story. I'm not going to go into details. Uh, bridge is a wonderful game. It involves a standard deck of cards. What are the suits in the standard deck of cards? Spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs. Could we play with um, corn, carrots, broccoli, and cucumbers? Yes. As somebody who's not a you know, huge fan of vegetables, I would not be happy with cards like that. Does it make any difference for the play of hands? No. For people who are experts at cards, they've actually done some studies, they can very quickly adjust to changing the names of the suits. But for people who are novices, seeing those new names throws people. How many of you have played the game 2048? How many of you have played the NESCAC version of 2048? Where they replaced the numbers uh, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. with the symbols of the different schools. And so, obviously, which school is number one? Yeah, Williams is the highest tile, the 2048. I believe Amherst is the two tile, but I'm not positive. Does it make any difference if you're playing 2048 if the tiles have school symbols on them or if they have the number? No. But it's much easier because you're so used to the numbers to manipulate it like that. So while it might seem trivial, it might seem like I'm emphasizing this too much, being able to cast algebra into a way that you have experience and comfort is valuable and worth doing. So we're going to study the log of n factorial, which is the log of n plus the log of n minus 1 plus the log of 1. Well, I can actually write that as the sum, k goes from 1 to n, of the log of k. 
And given that I've been mentioning Riemann sums you know, quite frequently, this should be well approximated by the integral of the log of t dt. Now you've got to be a little bit careful as to what are the bounds of integration. What do I have to be very careful about for my bounds of integration? Where would you like to start? Yeah. Why not zero? Uh, the log of zero is negative infinity. And there, there could be some issues with maybe starting at zero. So you've got to be careful. So maybe you know, one or zero, and maybe we go up to n or n plus one. So we've got to think as to exactly which way we're doing this. And so this leads back to the integral test. So I'm not going to go into you know, full detail. This is in the book. But we have a sequence which is monotonically increasing. And so we can approximate it very well with an integral. And the idea is the following. Here's 1, 2, 3, 4, n minus 1, n. And so one possibility is I go in regions like this. And then all the way up to here's n minus 1. And then here's n, here's n plus 1. And if I go like this from 1 to n plus 1, I overestimate. So 1 to n plus 1 overestimates. I could go from 0 to n and underestimate. And the way I would do that is instead, I would now have my stuff like this. And now my curve would be underestimating. And so I can get upper and lower bounds for log n factorial by going from you know, 0 to n or 1 to n plus 1. Okay, So I'm not going to go into too much detail. Most of the calculation is going to be the same. You know, they're going to be the same from you know, 1 to n. The question is just, do I have stuff over here or do I have stuff over there? So then the question becomes, how much am I off by? And you can estimate how much you're off by. Again, I'm not going to do the whole calculation. It's going to be basically these boxes. How much is this box over here? What's the area under the curve in this box? So how, how much area do I have in that, one, in that final box? It's not n. It's the log of n or the log of n plus 1. So this is basically the log of n. So in terms of how much my error is going to be, my error is going to be somewhere between 0 and the log of n. So error is between 0 and the log of n. What's halfway between 0 and the log of n? No. Well, it depends how you're doing. It depends how you pass that. One half of the log of n. Yes, yes. Half of the log of n. Okay? Halfway is one half log of n. And by the log laws, half of log of n is the log of the square root of n. The square root of n is quite important. If you go back and you look at Stirling's formula, we're not going to get the square root of 2 pi. This is where the square root of n is coming from. It's basically the error is halfway between the two extremes. So in Calc 3, you've hopefully seen the integral test. There are more refined versions of integration theory, where we convert sums to integrals and we keep track of the errors. This is called like the euler mascheroni theory. There's a beautiful result for stuff like this. And it gives you better estimates on what the error is. And the error is going to come down to things like half the sum of those two extremes. And that's roughly where the square root of n is going to come from. All right, so now what we can do is let's integrate, just for definiteness, to make life easy for us from 1 to n. Okay? I'm just trying to get a rough sense of what's going on. 
There is no excuse in a calculus class for getting a derivative wrong. All derivatives are easy. They're just repeated applications of the rules from calculus. There is every possible excuse for getting integration wrong. Well, not, I guess not for getting integration wrong, but for not knowing how to integrate. Why? Yeah. Uh, replace certain with almost every. Okay, almost every function cannot be integrated nicely. Log t is actually one of the few functions that has a nice antiderivative. It's t log t minus t. You may not know this, but you can check and see if I'm right by doing what? What do you do? Nope. How do you check and see if this is the... Just differentiate. And so, in fact, the way you find this is you guess the antiderivative of log t is t log t. Because if I have t log t, if I use the product rule to take the derivative, I get the derivative t is 1, so I get a log t. And then I get plus a t times the derivative of log t, that's 1 over t, plus 1. I'm off by too much, I then have to shift. I evaluate these at 1 and n, and I get n log n minus n. And I'm not going to worry about the 1 at the end. Okay, so just when I do the approximation, I get the log of n factorial is about n log n minus n. Or if I exponentiate, n factorial is about, uh, and here's the e coming into play, e to the n log n minus n. Well, e to the log n is n, so this gives me an n to the n, e to the minus n. Not bad. You know, Sterling is n factorial is n to the n e to the minus n squared of 2 pi n. We're getting n to the n e to the minus n. If we were to do the upper bound, we would actually get an n or an n plus 1 as well, because we'd have this extra log n piece. We don't have it for the lower bound. Halfway between 0 and log n is log of square root of n, which when we exponentiate would give us a square root of n. So just as a ballpark order of magnitude, you would expect that it should be of size n to the n, e to the minus n, square root of n. This is not a proof of Sterling, but at this point you should be very confident that something like this is probably right. Square root of n is probably the right stage for the next term, but at the very least we can have as a theorem an upper bound of n to the n plus 1, e to the minus n, and a lower bound of n to the n, e to the minus n. Okay, any questions on the integral test? So again, you're seeing a lot of applications of stuff we've done in you know, Calc 3. So the stuff is coming in, uh, probability is beautifully suited for stuff like this. There's some additional text in the class, I'm sorry, in the notes, uh, in the book, on you know, series and when the series converge and all that. What subject in math really gets into doing all the stuff rigorously well? It's real analysis, right? In Calc 3, you always say linear algebra. In this class, whenever I ask you anything, you always say real analysis. And you'll be right about 90% of the time. So in terms of making a lot of these arguments precise and accurate, to really deal with the sums, to really do the bookkeeping, that's real analysis. The last time I checked, this was supposed to be a pre-core 300 level class. So I'm not assuming anyone has taken real analysis. If you have, by all means, I'm happy to chat with you more about this, read the stuff in the book, and this is a great way to see where real analysis is used. If not, if you're going to be a math major or if you're going to be a stats major and still take real analysis, this is a great motivation for why we spend so much time in real analysis rigorously deriving this theory. It's precisely to handle questions like this. All right, what I want to do now is I want to do one more argument towards Stirling's formula. It's going to be a way to start us thinking about the central limit theorem. So CLT to Stirling. And we'll probably do the drunk random walk next time. So I'm going to assume the central limit theorem. So the central limit theorem says the following. If x1 through xn are i, i, d, r, v, nice, so nice is a technical condition that we will not define for a while. For this class, it'll mean the moment generating function exists. For now, just think all of the moments exist and do not grow too rapidly. With mean mu and variance sigma squared, then x1 
plus xn converges to being normally distributed, what would the mean be? So what will the mean of the sum be? Sum of the means, so n mu, and what will the variance be? Variance of a sum of independent random variables, sum of the variances, n sigma squared. So we know exactly what normal distribution is going to converge to. OK? All right. I'm sorry? Uh, the arrow oh, over here. I I D R V. Independent, identically distributed random variables. It's uh, one of the new words added to the English language. Uh, if you try to use that in Scrabble, however, you will be in trouble unless you're playing with a mathematician or a statistician. But I I D R V. Independent, identically distributed random variables. Okay. Lemma. Poisson. Random variables are nice. Okay, so we can we can use this now to prove Sterling. So we're going to do the following. Let x k be Poisson with parameter one, and we'll choose them to be independent. What is true about the sum of Poisson random variables? So we proved this earlier in the semester. The sum of Poisson is? Is Poisson. This is extremely rare. And the parameter is n. So recall the probability that xk equals m is going to be um, lambda to the m, e to the minus lambda over m factorial if xk is Poisson with parameter lambda. So this is what it means. This is the probability density uh, m greater than or equal to 0 is an integer. It is extremely unlikely to have a probability distribution and keep adding it to itself and have the same shape. Normally, the shape changes. These are stable distributions. Stable distributions are wonderful to work with. We've encountered two other stable distributions. What are the other stable distributions we've encountered? Cauchy and normal. And those are extremely valuable. We actually have two different ways of interpreting this sum. One interpretation is it's Poisson. The other interpretation is it's approximately normal. Uh, that's just Professor Gowdy. So because it's Poisson, the probability it takes on any value, we just choose the appropriate value for m. So we need to choose a good value. What would be a good value to look at for this sum? We need to choose a good value. What value? The mean. And the mean is? Lambda. And so this is... This is the sum of this is Poisson with parameter n, so we would choose n. So the probability it is n is the, the lambda is n, so it's going to be n to the n e to the minus n over n factorial. If you're trying to prove Sterling's formula, you cannot have a better start. Look at what we've got an n to the n e to the minus n divided by n factorial. Right? This is exactly what we want for Stirling's formula. This part is just the Poisson random variable with parameter n, the probability that it takes on the value exactly n. Well, this is supposed to converge to being a normally distributed random variable. So what should this probability be? It should be approximately equal to the and I'm going to integral from n minus a half to n plus a half e to the minus um, x minus n squared over 2n squared I'm sorry, over 2n, sorry, dx. So this step requires some justification. 
uh, especially because it's wrong. So let's put in a square root of 2 pi n. Now it's right. Here is a normal distribution. Which normal? It's a normal with mean n and variance n. We know that this is supposed to converge to being normally distributed with mean n and variance n by the central limit theorem. So I'm integrating the probability density. Why am I going from n minus a half to n plus a half? So why am I integrating from n minus a half to n plus a half? I'm trying to approximate the probability that a Poisson random variable with parameter n takes on the value n. So I will go back to the Red Sox-Yankees. The probability the Red Sox beat the Yankees e to pi? Lots of reasons why that's bad. You know, e is less than pi, so that's not going to happen. Um, Red Sox beat the Yankees pi to e. What's the probability that that happens? Zero. Baseball scores have to be discrete. We talked about in the mathematic modeling lecture on sabermetrics that we can approximate one score with continuous distributions and then we bin so that our values are in the center of the bin. So if this is going to be normally distributed, if I have a value of n, if I have a value of n plus one tenth or n minus one tenth, those should all be associated with my parameter taking on, my, my random variable taking on the value of n because this is discrete. So I will claim all the area under the normal from n minus a half to n plus a half is going to be the event that my Poisson random variable takes on the value n. And, and anything beyond that is in another like, bin? Yes, and anything beyond n plus one half would be in the n plus one bin. And anything before the n minus one half, exactly. So now I want to evaluate this integral. Well, x ranges from n minus one half to n plus one half. Let's replace x with uh, n minus one half plus t. So this is the same as one over square root of two pi n. So let's put the square root of two pi n over on the other side. So we get n to the n, e to the minus n, square root of two pi n divided by n factorial is approximately the integral from zero to one, e to the minus t squared over two n dt. Well, when n is really, really large, what does e to the minus t squared look like? If n is really large, what's e to the minus t squared looking like? So what's this exponential going to look like? If, t, if n is enormous, this looks like e to what? e to the 0. e to the 0 is 1. So this looks like I'm integrating 1 from 0 to 1. So this integral is approximately 1. So we showed n to the n, e to the minus n, square root of 2 pi n, divided by n factorial is approximately 1. All we have to do is we multiply by n factorial and we get sterling. So multiply by n factorial and we get n factorial is approximately n to the n e to the minus n square root of 2 pi n. So sterling's formula is following from applying the central limit theorem to sums of Poisson random variables. It's calculating things two different ways. This is one of the key ideas in common talks. Calculate something two different ways. There's Stirling's formula. Fortunately, we never need to use Stirling's formula to prove the central limit theorem. Otherwise, this would be a circular argument. OK, so on Monday's class, what I will do is I will prove the central limit theorem in the special case when we're flipping a fair coin. Even in that case, it's already hard enough. And then after that, we'll start moving into the generating functions chapter. So we'll almost surely get to some generating functions on Monday. All right, have a great weekend.